Since the release of my video on Secure Enclave, tons of comments have told me that Apple's NANDs are upgradable. My first thought was, oh man, boy did I ever screw this one up. But when I looked into it, it wasn't so straightforward. The root of these claims mostly come from a Chinese social media post that I definitely missed. Then came the problem of verifying it. Pretty much any major media that reported on SSD upgrades used this one source. I wanted more. This is the blood and guts version of how you can swap SSDs on an Apple Silicon Mac and whether if it's actually feasible to upgrade the Apple Silicon Mac's SSDs. Let's review the facts that I discovered when making my video on CephOS, Apple's secret operating system. Fact 1. Since 2016, Apple has ported over the Secure Enclave from iOS in the form of the T2 chipset, which provided services via BridgeOS as the T2 is more than just the Secure Enclave. Fact 2. During this time, Apple removed the ability to upgrade SSDs with outliers being computers like the iMac Pro and the Mac Pro 2019. Most computers from this point onward had soldered down SSDs, even in the non-T2 Macs like the MacBook 12-inch series. Fact 3. With Apple Silicon, Apple no longer needed a T2 chipset, thus folded the secure enclave into the system on a chip design. Apple now integrates the SSD controller for internal storage entirely on the SoC. This has been true for all Apple Silicon Macs thus far. Fact 4. Apple released the Mac Studio, the first Apple Silicon Mac with modular NANDs, meaning for the first time users were able to experiment with swapping NAND modules without requiring extreme measures to solder proprietary NAND that's in short supply. And for our final fact, Fact 5. The Mac Studio's SSDs were first thought to be unswappable, then confirmed to be swappable. Mac YouTuber Luke Miani first attempted a Mac Studio SSD swap and was unsuccessful. iFixit had its issues, but ultimately was able to swap the Mac Studio's SSDs. This was also confirmed by Linus Tech Tips, which attempted to swap the Mac Studio modules and were successful but unable to upgrade to larger SSDs. These developments were also covered by respectable tech publications like Ars Technica. Luke probably suffered some of the same problems iFixit originally had. Despite this, pretty much everybody's conclusion was the same. Apple is intentionally, deliberately restricting your access to your own device. But there is no benefit to shipping a machine with removable storage mediums that can't be upgraded. Storage swaps are possible, at least between drives of the same size. Jury's still out on upgrades, but we can always hope for a software update. Apple locks it through firmware. There's no reason they have to do that, but they do it anyway, and unless their customers make a great big stink about it, they're just gonna keep on doing this kind of thing. I will have these videos, of course, linked in the description, as they are all very good. Since my video was primarily focused on CEPOS as it exists today, and to keep narrative flow, I left out the next bits from the video, but I think this provides a nice explainer of the treatment of the NAND modules. I warn you, the next section is going to be dense, so feel free to skip ahead using the chapters, as I'm going to explain why you can't easily swap an SSD and a Mac, and also a pairing of boot drives. In Apple's white paper, the D2 Security Chip Overview, they give a great summary about APFS encryption. This gives us a nice overview on how Apple locks its storage. The next three paragraphs are important, but I'm not going to read them verbatim. Apple embeds a unique ID into the secure enclave during manufacturing, and it's done so in such a way that even Apple doesn't have access to it. With Apple's encryption engine, the unique identifier makes it impossible to decrypt a drive on another computer. This forms the basis for its encryption engine for storage and why merely having a decryption key alone is not enough to decrypt the contents of the SSD. Apple illustrates this concept with the quote on screen. And it goes on to explain this in greater detail, and another interesting point is in the following. If the file vault is not enabled on a T2 Mac during the initial setup assistant process, the volume is still encrypted, but the volume key is protected by the hardware UID and the secure enclave. So even if you're not using the file vault to encrypt the drive, it will still not be accessible without the secure enclave providing the UID. This also applies to the Apple Silicon Macs. 
The next source that I didn't really talk about is the Apple Platform Security Doc, where Apple outlines some of the latest security, like how the recovery OS on Apple Silicon is actually paired to that computer. This is accomplished using the UID. Even if you had a NAND with a recovery partition on it, it would not be able to launch it. This is why you can't use a recovery partition on an external device. It has to be paired for your device, assuming I didn't misinterpret Apple's data. Just so we're clear, this does not apply to external media as a whole, only the recovery OS. If your SSD dies, it leaves your Mac in an unbootable state. Well, mostly. We'll come back to that. So if you take the scenario of swapping SSDs between Mac Studios, it cannot boot into the recovery mode since that's paired to a different computer. Even for Apple, this would be completely off the rails if they didn't have some way to service a Mac that was rendered unbootable after corruption of the main OS and recovery OS. In this same document, under Local Policy Signing Key Creation and Management, we get the explanation of how it was installed at the factory and how it could be installed again. When macOS is first installed from the factory, or when a tethered array install is performed, the Mac runs code from a temporary restore RAM disk to initialize the default state. So yeah, it's really complicated, but there is this tethered mode they mentioned. This tethered mode is DFU, Device Firmware Update. It's a special boot mode on Apple Silicon devices that allow users to update and restore firmware on the device. Longtime iPhone users may be familiar with DFU mode already, but it became part of Macs as of the T2 and made the transition to Apple Silicon. In DFU mode, the device is able to communicate with another Mac and can be restored to its factory settings or update to the latest firmware version. It requires a second Mac to fix the first Mac using the Apple configurator, and unlike the recovery OS, is part of the secure ROM, and is a last-ditch effort for when the recovery OS is corrupt or unbootable. I've linked in the docs how to reach the DFU mode for both T2 and Apple Silicon. It's very similar. The DFU mode will reinstall Recovery OS, aka Apple's Recovery Mode, on the storage media, then the Mac can be booted into the Recovery Mode and perhaps fix the boot volume or reinstall Mac OS altogether. I know that was headache inducing, but there is a way to install Mac OS onto a fresh SSD. The reason you have to do it this way is because of very tight security. And for the uber nerds out there, I'm not going to touch on the Lifeboat connector because that is only found on old MacBook Pros. I don't think I made this point very clearly in my previous video, but you can still boot off a external drive, even if as a T2 chipset or as Apple Silicon. I boot off an NVMe in my Mac Pro 2019, which is not the internal SSD. But if you remove the internal Apple proprietary SSDs, the computer will not boot. Now that we've caught up on the world building and lore, we can return to the main story. DFU is where people got stuck, like Luke and iFixit. Then later, I think after a DFU update, both iFixit and LTT were able to swap SSDs. This is where I figured this entire story ended. And I admit I made kind of a haphazard speculative leap, but I had missed a mysterious subplot in the form of the Chinese social media post. When I ask users for any better sources, two of the viewers of my videos really stepped up and gave me some pretty good information. Thanks SSS Low, or is it Slow? Anyhow, and also thanks to Madhouse Woolard. Then another viewer by the name of Peter Wan also pointed me to a very useful YouTube video that just confirmed what the other two guys had just told me. This video illustrates how you replace the NAND in a MacBook Air M1. And once you're done, you do the DFU restore. At this point, I felt like you could confidently say you can upgrade to Apple Silicon laptop storage or the Mac Mini. (laughs) I was wrong in my first video. You can indeed upgrade your SSDs. Well, provided you have serious soldering skills and the ability to source the NANDs. But what about the Mac Studio? I tried calling a local authorized Mac dealer that did Mac repairs, and I'll leave them nameless, but I spoke to an employee who was kind enough to humor me when I asked if I could replace the SSD in a Mac Studio with a larger one. And of course I was told no, but when I asked if the DFU mode would restore it to a larger one, he seemed intrigued, but didn't have an answer. The other shop I called didn't feel like chatting, they just told me they could only replace the SSD. I was still at a dead end, unable to find any more information online. Then, a breakthrough. I stumbled across a post on the Mac Rumors forums. 
that would contain the answers I was looking for. User Gilly Polysoft was not able to just swap SSDs, but to upgrade a Mac Studio from 512 gigabytes to 4 terabytes. Gillies outlines the process and hits on the first obvious truth. Apple does not sell replacement or upgrade NAND cards for the Mac Studio. They are not available anywhere at present. Secondly, he speculates someone armed with a JCID programmer and the skills for BGA soldering that they could probably upgrade their Mac Studio. Of course, they need the right NAND modules too. However, this breakthrough doesn't mean that Macs are user serviceable in any sane way. Apple still has a tight control on the supply lines disallowing for any third parties from creating SSDs for the Mac Studio. Very technically inclined individuals may have the ability to potentially repair these machines, maybe. And this is why the internet can be so wonderful. You can always find out that you are wrong. Thanks everybody.